Whoever fights monsters should see to it that in the process, he does not become a monster. In his crusade to defend Mormonism against monsters, Kweku L is himself becoming a monster. This Ouroboros-like cycle plays out in our lives regularly, both on a micro and macro scale. In our quest to stand up to our bully, we ourselves risk becoming a bully. In our mission to fight terrorism, we likewise risk becoming terrorists. The question is, where's the line? At what point does one become the very monster they set out to kill? Righteous indignation leads to righteous action. Righteous action leads to victories. Victories can lead to comfort and pride. Comfort and pride lead to insecurity and paranoia. Insecurity and paranoia lead to brashness and betrayal. Brashness and betrayal leads to self-destruction. Self-destruction leads to either redemption or damnation. Kweku has entered into brashness. Kweku L is an LDS apologist most known for his work on the popular YouTube channel Saints Unscripted, formerly known as Three Mormons. He is a student at Brigham Young University and engages in debates with Christians, most commonly evangelical Protestants. Speaking as to why he decided to engage in LDS apologetics, Kweku states, When I started my own channel, I realized I do not want to be like the rest of religious YouTube. So much is at stake because young people are flocking away from religion and the gospel and God and a belief in something that isn't just like postmodern wokest theory. Like the stakes are really high and we need to be doing something and we can't just do the things that didn't work. We can't just let an entire generation go inactive in the gospel. We just can't do that. Kweku wants to put a dent in the younger generations who are becoming less religious and he wants to do so in a new way. He sees religious YouTube as ineffective and stuck in its old ways. He seeks to use charisma, humor, and emotion to connect with audiences. Appealing to emotion is a particular hallmark of Kweku's approach to debate and apologetics. Having grown up LDS myself, I understand this feeling of righteous indignation against evangelical Protestants. Since the advent of YouTube, Mormonism has been a favorite target of evangelicals. Kweku identifies this, saying, So evangelical anti-Mormons have been on YouTube since the beginning. Um, Aaron Schaff has been making videos attacking the church for like 10 years, like a decade now. Like I was in middle school, just starting high school, when he started doing this. He's been doing this forever, and he's at Temple Square, almost every general conference, holding up a sign, and, and he and his buddies, and really the, the, the evangelicals of Utah, a bunch of them, go to Temple Square, they hold up side and start yelling at these Mormon teenagers as they walk into the conference center, and they have pictures of Jesus in hell saying, the Mormon Jesus in hell, and Joseph Smith's head on a stake, and just disgusting things, right? These people have been attacking the church forever, and what we've done as Latter-day Saints online is we've said we're above responding. We don't need to respond to that. We don't need to defend ourselves. Let's just go bear our testimony and leave it at that. And that attitude has left us like ducks in a barrel to just be shot at. It let a bunch of people in our church be led out because their testimony is on the rocks. And they look at it and they see anti-Mormon evangelical guy is making points. And these guys are just going, um, no, not true. I believe the church is true. And they're walking away. And he goes, are we right? Because these guys are making good points and our side's not. It's so serious. People leave the church and the culture has been, we just let that happen. And I said, screw that. I'm fighting back. Kweku's outrage and mission here are very understandable. And one might even say, noble. Taking the fight to the enemy, Kweku has discovered some very poignant critiques of Protestant history, such as Martin Luther's anti-Semitism and John Calvin's involvement in the execution of Michael Servetus. Kweku states that for decades, Mormons have been on the defensive, and now a favorite strategy of his is to put Christians on the defensive. Kweku is determined to not only defend Mormonism, but to strike back at its critics. Kweku states, I say, I'm not only going to defend the gospel, I'm going to hit you back. The long-standing reaction for many Mormons against critics has been to remain silent or allow themselves to sit on the defensive. Kweku wants to turn that trend on its head. 
Kwaku has been engaged in this crusade for four years now. For four years, he has been fighting monsters. Could it be that now cracks are beginning to show? In describing his perspective, Kwaku states of these evangelical anti-Mormons, There is not a world that exists in which they'll just let us be and we'll let them be. They will always be trying to take people away from the LDS Church. They will always be trying to destroy testimonies. That's just the way it is. Kwaku's next words reveal an especially bitter and unforgiving view of Christians and the potential for sincere goodwill between the two factions. I go after the evangelicals and they'll be like, hey, not all of us are like this. And I'll be like, yeah, but you stood by and let it happen. You're an evangelical kid, you live in Salt Lake City, or you live in Pocatello, or you live in Eagle, Idaho. You got a lot of Latter-day Saint friends. You didn't stop your pastor or your uh, youth minister when they started sharing the leaked temple film online. You didn't stop them when they were sharing absolute falsehoods about the church. You just sat by and let it happen. A lot of the evangelicals will be like, Kwaku, these anti-Mormon Calvinists don't represent us. I'm not a Calvinist. But I'll let the Calvinists represent us when it comes to tearing down your church. And I go, yeah, no, sorry. You sat by and let it happen. So in our eyes, the blame's on you too. You sat by and you let prejudice build. You let bigotry happen. You let this anti-Mormon just like disease spread. And now that the Latter-day Saints are fighting back, you're like, no, 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 we're different. You let it happen. Sorry, I got to come after you too. You weren't different. You sat by and let it happen. So in our eyes, the blame is on you too. You let it happen. Sorry, I got to come after you too. Kwaku's feelings come from a place of hurt, insecurity, and anger. These are very understandable feelings. Many of us have felt this way when someone made unkind comments about our ideas, religious views, or political opinions. So the starting point for Kwaku's crusade is rather understandable. Mormons have been pushed around for long enough. Let's push back and show them their own faults. In a recent debate with Aaron Shafafalov, an evangelical Christian and research associate for Mormon Research Ministry, Kwaku critiqued Protestantism noting Martin Luther's anti-Semitism and John Calvin's involvement in getting a person executed for heresy. What is noteworthy, though, is not necessarily what Kwaku was trying to illustrate, but how he did so. Kwaku emphasizes not just emotion, but hyperbole. Uh, last year, a high school girl in the American Fork area was taken by a terrible, terrible man, beaten, tortured. Um, she was assaulted and raped repeatedly. They found her body in the woods. Did God predestine the rape of that, fut, that fifth grade girl and her beating and assault? Did he predestine it before the foundations of the world? Do you believe Brigham Young being wrong is worse than the death of six million Jews? Do you really believe that? Because I hope not. When you look at Protestant history, you don't see the fruits of Christ. You see the most bloodshed and murder, perhaps in this continent's history. As we have seen already, Kwaku frequently conjures gruesome, graphic imagery and makes associations between his opponents and despicable groups. His favorite comparison is Nazis. Although some might see these tactics as disingenuous or cheap, the essential facts have essentially still been there. But, Kwaku has been walking a tightrope, and in following videos, it would seem he has lost his balance. In recent uploads, Kwaku has been very reckless with his information, suggesting either a confirmation bias, poor fact-checking, outright dishonesty, or all three. For example, in You Need to Know This About Joseph Smith, Kwaku argues for the case that Joseph Smith is in fact the second messiah. Messiah ben Yosef. This is a tradition amongst some Jews that there will be, in fact, two redeemers, Messiah ben David and Messiah ben Joseph. The criteria that Kwaku cites, which makes Joseph Smith a match for Messiah ben Joseph, are very selective. He ignores the other very important criteria that define Messiah ben Joseph. When these criteria are examined as a whole, it is clear that Joseph Smith is not and in fact could not have been the Messiah ben Joseph of Judaic tradition. Being wrong with such a platform as he has is reckless, but people make mistakes. 
this is only human. It is possible that he saw some information on this topic, got excited, and made a video in a short period of time without sufficiently fact-checking and researching the subject. However, in a recent video, this recklessness is combined with outright malice and deception. In Explaining the Great Apostasy, How Christianity Fell, Kwaku misapplies scripture, takes quotes from the early church fathers grossly out of context, and applies glaring double standards to his Christian opponents. The Trinity doctrine was literally created by terrorists. I want you to understand that. These are murderers and psychopaths. Early Christians were on the same level as Nazis. They were on the same levels as the folks behind the Russian gulags. They are on the same level as the people who flew planes into the Twin Towers at in 2001. I mean, these are bad people. If you knew how your religious tradition started, and when they say the church was never lost, it was always preserved, these are the people they're talking about who preserved it. Terrible, terrible people who did not have the spirit with them. These were the equivalent of the SS, of the Third Reich. These were not followers of God. Not at all. This video has since been thoroughly debunked by Louise Dizon in this article, which I will link in the description below. As a cherry on top, if the poor information and delivery weren't enough to tip you off that he has no understanding or depth on the subject, his continual mispronunciations should. Cyril of Jerusalem, another Christian church father. So they came up with a term called homoiousis. Homoiousis? Homoiousis? Flavius Julianus. The ex-governor Fidistius, um, Hilarius, Patricius, in the year 380 under the emperor Theodosius, uh, Nestorius, the archbishop of Rome, and then in 381, a year later, Theodosius, in fact, Quaku's tract of thought follows, almost beat for beat, this very simplistic article. It isn't a stretch to imagine this was Quaku's template for the video. If not, then in any case, it is apparent he has not thought his own standards through to their logical implications. Quaku's criticisms of Christianity as it was adopted by the Roman Empire are the very same criticisms one could level against Mormonism. One could mention the LDS Church not allowing black people to hold the priesthood until 1978, well after the Civil Rights Movement, or the vile racism espoused by church leaders for decades. One could also mention the Mountain Meadows Massacre, in which Mormons butchered up to 140 innocent travelers, one could mention as well the Mormon pioneers, who pushed Native Americans out of their ancestral lands and desecrated their burial grounds, which were contributing factors to tensions that led to the Utah Black Hawk War, which the Native Americans, of course, lost. To top it all off, one could mention that Brigham Young ordered an extermination of all Timpanogos Indians, except for women and children who behaved. In the aftermath of this conflict, Mormon pioneers took over 40 Indian women and children as Servants. This, of course, is only a handful of examples, but it is certain that if the LDS Church had been around for 2,000 years, instead of only 190, they would have many more such incidents under their belt. But, according to Kwaku, some bad people doing bad things in the name of their religion constitutes a universal apostasy. By his own logic, then, the LDS Church fell into apostasy almost immediately after Joseph Smith was assassinated. Of course, Kwaku does not apply his own standard against Christianity to Mormonism. In this Saints Unscripted episode called Blacks and the Priesthood, Kwaku and his co-host provide very understanding, contextual, and nuanced commentary on the LDS Church's history of racism. So it's no surprise that the leaders of our church at the time had pretty racist views. Um, I think we can just say that openly. But I think it's also important to remember that the views that they had that were racist are not doctrine, they're not true, and we don't have to look at them as if they're from a god. Exactly, and I think it's really important to also realize that when we're studying these things out outside of this episode, and we go mm -hmm. into the church and how they treated you know, blacks at the time, we need to understand that we're not obliged to agree with everything the prophet said in regards to his opinions. Yeah, that's why we have the Spirit. Yeah, exactly. Opinions of people are not doctrine, but mm -hmm. doctrine will be revealed. And it's, it's important to realize when a prophet says that this is doctrine. Yeah. And when they're talking about 
things that are kind of racist, there's never in the point of history where they're like, this is doctrine. If opinions of Mormons was doctrine, then um, wearing chacos would be enough to send you straight to the Telestial. And campaign. everyone would be subscribers to Glenn Beck's show. <laughs> so you see, Mormonism gets to have very understanding, contextual, and nuanced explanations for their rough history, but Christians don't. If Kwaku had been as honest with Christianity as he was with this dicey topic, we would have seen a much more nuanced, fair, and respectable video. That Kwaku repeatedly refers to Christians as evil, terrorists, murderers, psychopaths, and he compares Christians to ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Stalinists, and, of course, Nazis, reveals the true underlying motive at work. While on the surface this video is aimed at proving there was a universal apostasy within Christendom, something the video obviously fails at, its true essence, by all accounts, appears to be a mere hit piece. You are fake news. Kwaku's motive here is not to give an honest and thoughtful argument for his position, but rather to attack Christianity. This explains why the video lacks substance, context, nuance, and any semblance of fairness. What Kwaku is doing here is making up for his lack of knowledge on the subject by utilizing his charisma and painting the most gory, detailed picture possible. Kwaku understands marketing and how to appeal to the masses. On that count, the video does succeed. However, the actual result is a poisoning of the waters. Kwaku's growing tendency to label and associate his opponents with the most vile elements possible is nothing new in the Western world. In fact, Kwaku's behavior falls right in line with the tactics used in cancel culture. What cancel culture reveals is if one can associate a person or organization with something truly vile, such as the alt-right or Hitler, that person or organization will not only be humiliated and immediately be put on the defensive, but they will almost always lose, and almost always accommodate any demands made. Put simply, it's a dirty tactic that gets you a cheap, fast win. While cancel culture, outrage, and fantastic appeals to emotion are very effective in the short term, they ultimately have disastrous results. As it pertains to this character study, what Kwaku is doing by associating Christianity with Nazism is shutting down what could otherwise be a meaningful conversation. He is doing this to win favor from the masses, but what he is simultaneously doing is harming his own reputation, professional life, and ability to have fruitful debates in the future. Kwaku's unscrupulous tactics have already become a talking point in apologetic circles and relevant social media forums such as Reddit and Facebook. I myself have spoken with a number of noteworthy apologists, both Christian and LDS, who have expressed hesitance to do videos or debates with Kwaku for these reasons, because they do not feel that he is professional or honest. I'm sure that Kwaku has seen every anti-Mormon video out there. He is well aware of all the unfair, mean-spirited things said about Mormons and the LDS religion. But what I don't think Kwaku is aware of is that in his noble crusade to stand up for Mormonism and highlight its critics' own shortcomings, he is himself becoming that which he sought to destroy. In his hunt for monsters, Kwaku is himself becoming a monster. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed that video, then be sure to hit the like and subscribe button, and click the bell icon to be notified anytime I upload new content. It really does help, and I really do appreciate it. Stay savvy, and I'll catch you in the next video.